So in a, in a context like that, where all of your friends are successful, but, but you're not, so you lie ab about it. Um, in that kind of a sense, who are you lying to? Yourself. 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 I mean, actually, quite literally, too, I'm wondering. You mean, are we lying to our friends about how successful we are? Or are we lying to uh, everybody? Okay, so we're lying to everybody about, about being successful. So I guess the question becomes, why isn't that person successful? What are some things that would have caused that person to not be successful? They're in unmotivation. So they're unmotivated, maybe. Yes, I could, yeah. Maybe no one um, ever gave them like, any, any spark to actually do. Maybe it was never told to like, actually go out and do something. Maybe. Never. He wasn't inspired. But the person was never inspired. That's such a hard one, too. That's such a hard one. Because, I mean, we look at a lot of times these, these keys to, to success, or I mean, even just keys to living, I guess you might say. And so much of it just has to do with, with who you come across. With who you come across. And then, like, a, a big part of this is, is the inspired thing. I think I told you that um, I had a, a math teacher. I had two, well, two math teachers who changed my life in very dramatic ways. One of them was Mr. Casasabe, uh, was his name. He's probably dead today. Um, if not, probably should be. And he, I remember him, uh, I was in the class, and he, he was, just, well, I mean, to, even to me, as, as a, whenever I was, like, a sophomore or ninth grade, I can't remember I was, I think it was a ninth grade. Even to me, the ninth grade, I thought he was very small. And I was tiny as a ninth grader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so even me, at that height, I imagine he was probably very small. And he used to wear a, a, a shirt and tie every day. I think he was from, like, Peru, if I'm not mistaken. He's, and, and, he, and he would, he would uh, talk like this. Very dramatic. And he'd, always, and he'd go in there and he'd explain to us that uh, white people can't do math. That it's not in our blood, but that he would tell us that Latino people, they can do math. He says, it's in your blood. He says, I show you. Watch these. I can't do math. Watch these. Gringo scum. What is the answer to number three? And I would say, the answer says, shut up. You do not know. And I'd go, oh, maybe he's right. <laughs> maybe he saw my answer. He's trying to save me from some kind of humiliation. I don't know. And he, and he, and he would talk about it. And, and you wouldn't shy from it. You know, like, if there was anybody in the room, it's just the way, it's the way that he was. And he wouldn't, sometimes he wouldn't grade my papers because he would tell me it was a waste of time because white people can't do math. And uh, after a while, you start to believe him, like, oh, he's, he seems like he knows math. Maybe he's a good judge of character. I don't know. <laughs> and then, uh, then I had a math teacher who I think I told you told us that we were all basically retarded and wouldn't learn math anyway. <laughs> so I'm like, well, okay, so that explains why I couldn't do math in the first place. Now I understand it. Um, and, and I feel like it, it should have bothered me more than it did. You know, um, I know that the second guy, his name was Mr. Sickler. And I only remember his name once in a while. Whenever I try to remember his name a lot of times, I just, I can't, I can't recall it. But right now, he's popping into my head, Mr. Sickler. I know he died from a brain tumor not too long ago. Um, because I was, I was looking him up, so I was send him an email. <laughs> um, but I think I told you he would come in and tell us that we were all basically retarded. Couldn't learn math anyway. So he would read us stories. And, I, and he was a writer. He'd write these stories. And his stories were all about, like, castles and dragons and stuff like that. Um, and I thought, well, well, maybe he's right. Maybe I am basically retarded and, and can't do math. But I like I like stories. That's interesting. I should study more about that. I'd already read quite a bit, but I started to put most of my attention and energy into into that stuff and, and completely away from math, which I think I was telling you is a fascinating thing because when my when my mom died, I was going through some old papers and I found these old aptitude tests. I think I was telling you about this. Um, going through like a first through fourth grade, we had to take these things every year, and it would tell you what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And all of the ones that I had there, I finished in the top 1% in the country in math and science. That's what I should have been, that's where my, my aptitude was towards. I finished in the bottom 20% for language, the thing that I'm teaching. Right, and so I, I, I sometimes I also I'll wonder like, man, what if I really put myself into to, to math and science? And I find it interesting, and. And if you teach it to me, I remember it very quickly. And that seems to be what my mind is mostly geared towards. But I really like stories. I really like language. So it tells you that, uh, that a desire for something or an interest in something can overcome a lot of, 
of, I shouldn't say deficiencies, but you get what I'm saying with that. And so, I, mean, I wonder if I had a, a different inspiration. And if I, and if I went, if, if Pastor Simon was still alive, and if he was, I mean, he, he wasn't, he, he, I mean, he could be, he wasn't like ancient at the time. But if I went and talked to him, I don't even know if he'd even remember that I even existed. I doubt it. I really, really doubt that he even know I existed. Um, I don't think he, I think if I, if I mentioned that to him today in 2022, he'd probably deny, oh, I, I didn't need to tell students that. But yeah, you did. Every, you know, constantly, constantly. And I remember it too, like going to my mom and telling my mom about it. Just not like, mom, this is what's happening, but telling her. And my mom's answer to it was, well, he's your teacher. You have to figure out a way to make it work. <laughs> so you, have to, you should tell me, you have to make sure that your work is right every single time. You have to make, you know. Um, I didn't understand it quite so much at the time as a kid, but I, I really understand it um, now. I did understand it within a couple of years, which was you can't always control these things. And it was, a, it was more of a, of a, of a life lesson. Um, was it fair? Absolutely not. Um, I remember I had a first grade teacher. I remember her name too all of a sudden. That's weird. Her name was Miss Otis. And Miss Otis was very, very mean to me. And I didn't ever understand why. And then it um, turns out that there was a paired conference which I'm, I, I found out later on about um, years later when I understood it better. But Miss Otis didn't like me. It turns out she really actually genuinely didn't. Because I told you that my dad used to work at McDonald's. Turns out one year, uh, one year she, um, one summer, she worked at McDonald's that my dad was the manager at, and my dad fired her for stealing. <laughs> and my name is, uh, it's you know, not incredibly unique, but especially with the scandal in L.A. and rather than L.O. and that's one that you normally find. She recognized the name and she asked me about my dad, and so I told her, and so it carried over. <laughs> so once in a while, you do find I, when people tell me like this teacher, they just don't like me. I, I can see that sometimes. A lot of times, it's like, yeah, I don't have time to, to pick and choose those students, but some teachers do have that time, so I, I get it. But, like, you know, what, what inspiration you come across, because that's going to take care of a lot of times this motivation thing. If you come across the right person who can motivate you in, in the right ways, and you can get interested in the subject, you know, you can overcome a lot if you're, if you're interested, if you're inspired in the proper ways. If you never come across that, well then... <clears throat> To a couple things happen. Maybe you never get pushed in that direction. People will oftentimes say, like, you shouldn't need external inspiration. Maybe. Maybe. But lots of people get it anyway. And we can't deny that it's, it's very helpful. Certainly. Even if you don't have it inside of you, yeah, certainly it's very helpful to have that thing. Um, but now, if you've, if you've never got really well inspired, and, th and therefore you never ended up motivated, and then you therefore don't achieve the things that you could have achieved, well, now you also live in a, in, a, in, a, in a society, which, by the way, we like to, you know, pick and choose them and say, this society, it's most societies around the world. I mean, come on, let's be honest about it. If you're failing, they're not going to sit there and celebrate you for being a failure. You're going to feel bad about yourself because you're going to see people around you who succeed. And some of the worst aspects of it are when you see people who aren't as talented and skilled or any of these things as you are, and you see them succeed. You're trying to figure out why is that, that, that those people are, are giving ahead. So we start to imagine all kinds of, of, of explanations for that. But now you, so now you feel bad about yourself. Well, you're, well, now you, I guess you're uninspired, which makes life generally very difficult to live. And then you're unmotivated. And then you, um, you're, you're, not, you're not getting ahead. You're going to be angry. You're going to feel like that everything's against you. It's just this big spiral that can kind of get out of control. And so we can avoid some of that just by... But I guess just by lying about, about ourselves. Oh, yeah. And, we, and, we do, and a lot of people do it in these weird ways. I think I told you that when I was growing up, I saw a lot of really, I shouldn't say expensive, nice Lexuses parked in front of really crappy apartment buildings. Because people would like to, to you know, they'd leave home, they'd leave their home life, get in their car, and they could drive around and pretend to be successful. But it tells you that that's how they envision success. Some people will pretend to be smarter than they are. That's how they envision success. So, um, what does that therefore mean? Well, if you're lying about yourself, you should stop. You should stop telling, you know, start telling the truth. Or at the very least, stop lying about yourself. But now you can start to figure out the kinds of things that you really do wish that you could do in life. If you're lying to people and telling them, oh yeah, I ran the LA Marathon. Now you know that you wish you were someone who could run the LA Marathon. 
and that you'd feel better about yourself if you actually did do that thing. So what do you do? You go to the LA Marathon next year. You don't have to win it. You just have to finish it. And it's only 26 miles, 26.1 miles. I mean, it's, it's not only that, but you, know, you don't have to run the whole thing. It's not like you're trying to win the thing. You just want to be a part of it. Go do it. Finish it. And if you go do it, let's see, you, you run half of it, you, you walk half of it, or you walk two-thirds of it, you run the other third of it, fine. But now at the end of it, you get, your, you get your, your medal and you get your picture and everything. Now you can say, good, now I am a person who has finished this. And hopefully that kind of thing will inspire you to make you wonder, I wonder what else I could do if I just kind of put my mind to it. That would be a fascinating thing for you guys to do at some point, to, to find yourself singularly minded on something, anything. A anything at all. Um, something academic, something hobby related, something exercise related, something um, service related. And commit yourself for one year to that one thing. I, I, think you'd be, I think you'd be amazed at what you could accomplish by that. How great you could become at something by doing that. It's, it's quite phenomenal, really. Um, but most of us won't, won't understand that because we've never done that before. Or even just do it for six months. You know, and I mean, like, be, be singularly minded about that thing. Think about something in your life that you are singularly minded about right now. My guess is there probably aren't many things, if anything at all, for most of us. And so what that means is you've never taken the, the, the opportunity, to the opportunities there, you've never taken the opportunity to explore the, the depths of your talents, to see what you really are capable of doing, what you really could do. And so if you feel like, you know, you're uninspired, you're unmotivated, or you feel like you don't have a direction, you feel like... You know, maybe you're suffering from some, some, some low self-esteem and you don't think you could do things very well. Just try that. Because even if you're not particularly talented at it, if you're singular-minded on it and other people are not, you're going to excel past them. At the very least, what you're going to learn is what you could do. Now, if you find yourself in something that you really enjoy then, and, you, and you're singular-minded on it, I mean, you're going to be, you know, you're going to over, you're, I don't want to say unstoppable, but damn close to it. And then if you are somebody who is singularly minded on it and and you enjoy it and it turns out you're really good at it. Well man, now you've got all three of those things all lined up perfectly. And now you really genuinely are unstoppable. You find the thing that you're passionate about, find the thing that you're that you're talented in, hopefully look at the same thing, hopefully. And then you find yourself focused on that thing. You, it's hard for me to say things like this because it's, they sound like rah rah speech. Like, oh, come on, you can do this. Hopefully, you know that I'm not that guy. Um, there are going to be things in life that, you know, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. No, simply not true. Sometimes your talents, are, you're, you're not going to be good enough. And that's a hard thing for us to, to come to grips with like, because you want something. And maybe the thing that you want is not the thing that you should have. Maybe the thing that you want is not the thing that would be good for you. Maybe it's not the thing that you that really genuinely would make you joyous or, or happy. I, I don't know. In fact, I don't think any of us really know what that thing is that would make us joyous and happy until we, we, we have it. In other words, you can pursue this thing that you think is going to make you happy. A dream job, a, a dream relationship, uh, a dream vacation. But, I mean, th that's exactly what those things are. They're dreams. That's all that they are. They're dreams. Once you accomplish them... Well, now you can understand the reality of it. And hopefully the reality is, is just as powerful as the dream. Um, hopefully it, it really is. Or at the very least, hopefully you find something along the ways as you're getting there that's more powerful. It actually does, it doesn't just hold your eye, it, it holds your heart as well. It holds your interests. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a hard way of coming here. The, weak, the weaker you are, the more dishonest you have to be to survive. But notice you're talking about a survival thing here. It tastes pretty extreme, man. This is why you can't trust weak people. And there's something that's definitely there. A person who doesn't have the strength to tell you the truth is a person who will go to great lengths to keep the truth from you. Especially if it's something that, puts, that makes them vulnerable. If you have a person who, um, who, who you ask him something like, um, do, you, you know, do you like, a, I don't know, you, you like my haircut, and the person you know, is afraid to tell the truth, so they say, oh yeah, I love it, I love it. Now, what else is that person not willing to tell you the truth about for fear of offending you? And that person now is, is very weak because they're like, I don't want to lose this friend. That's what it comes down to. We might say, well, no, it's because they're trying to be nice. Okay, but why? 
because if they if they tell you the truth, they're going to feel bad. It's more. It really is about them too. Like, oh, but but if I tell you the truth, you're going to feel bad. Yeah, but you're going to feel bad about making me feel bad. Yes. So that's probably what it really is more than anything. Because, well, as, as Oscar Wilde said, a true friend stabs you in the front. So if that person is too afraid to tell you the truth about your hair, are they going to be? Uh, are they going to be the person who can tell you the truth about about uh, a relationship that you owe them for advice for? Uh, a person who's going to tell you the truth about um, a, a career opportunity or an interview or something like that? Um, about about family members that you're having issues with? Is that person going to be strong enough to tell you the truth about anything? Of course not. Probably not. Uh, so I'll say probably not because I'm being generous. But of course not. You know, they can't tell the truth about the simplest thing for fear of what's going to happen. And what is it really about? That person doesn't want to lose friends because they don't feel strong on their own. They identify themselves not by their individual status, but by having the people around them. And you're part of that. So there's a fear there of losing friends, of losing, and then loss of friends naturally means to them loss of identity as well. And so they're weak in that sense. They can't stand on their own. They have to have a group. And that's why you can't trust them because that's a person who will, who will do what they will do what they think they need to, to maintain the status quo, to maintain what they presently have. And you're not, you're, you're simply like a, a desk in that equation. You're not a human being. You're a thing to be used. You're a thing to be there for, for convenience. And then, of course, if you allow that to happen, then when you discover it, it makes you weak as well. Deception and disloyalty is basically their only means of survival. Um, how many of you have seen The Lion King? You're asking okay. Scar. Scar. Scar, he, he's not strong enough to be king, so he has to use deceit, manipulation, backstabbing, guile. He has to do all of those things because he isn't as strong as Mufasa. He's not as strong as Simba is going to be. So he has to use lies, backstabbing, to, to, to accomplish that. And you'll see this is true. People will, will, will talk behind your back because they don't have the courage to confront you directly. So they'll, rather than kind of come at you directly, they'll, they'll run their mouths behind you because what they're trying to do is chip away at other people's support of you. Because they're trying to get you isolated. They're trying to destroy your reputation. They're trying to isolate you so that you don't have the strength to stand up against them. You know? What's that? Is that true? Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely true. This is why we talk behind people's backs. That's why we don't ask them directly. And I'm talking about specifically talking behind someone's back. Not like, I heard this about somebody. But more like you're trying to destroy their reputation. Because if you can, again, if you can destroy their reputation, you can destroy their peer group. Don't trust that person. Oh no, that person, they do this, they do that. Oh my god, you're not associated with them, are you? You're trying to isolate them. <clears throat> it, isn't too un, it isn't too unlike what we see right now with regards to like cancel culture. Why do we try to cancel people? Because right now where they are, they're too strong. They have too many friends around them. They're too, their business is too strong. So what do we have to do? We have to try to erode all that, get rid of all that, so that way you're isolated, you're, you're by yourself. And isolated by yourself, their thinking is, well, then you're not strong. Now I can come against you. And then I can make you feel this way. But not by coming at you directly, but by going to your, all your peripheral. That's why you have to be careful who you, who you count among your friends. If you, if, if, if you have people around you who, you who you can't, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it's that dramatic, but I'll say it anyway, the people that you can't rely on with your life, you can't depend on them with your life, well then, those are people who are going to be vulnerable to being, you know, to, to the backstabbing. I think about some of your friends, and if I, um, if I, if I, no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about one of my friends right now, and she's just absolutely awesome, and uh, she, um, it's a long story, but well, someone got mad at me once. And they were, and, and um, my friend contacted her and was like, well, Stephen started to badmouth me, and my friend, his name is V. V just stopped, goes, said, said, stop. I don't care what Stephen did. I don't care if he did it. I don't care if he didn't do it. I'm on team Stephen. And so this other person said, okay. And I guess hung up the phone. <laughs> That's a person that you need to have around you, people like that. And if I ever asked V something about myself, V is the kind of person who would stab me in the front not in the back. Now, I do have other people who, who I know of, I don't count them among my friends, but you know, they're kind of in the periphery, where if you went to them and told them something about me, and even if you completely, you know, something negative, and completely made it up, they would probably be like, I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, it's not worth being part of, because what if it is true? Most of us are surrounded by people like that. 
But when you have like real friends around you, they're not vulnerable to those kinds of things. And by the way, if you did do something terrible, those are the same people who would stand by you, not and, and not hopefully say, I don't care what you did, but maybe say, that's messed up, you know? And they'll, they'll, they'll tell you that. They'll still defend you because they're defending you, not what you did, but they're defending you. And they understand that everybody messes up. But it's that weak person who has to kind of go behind your back and attack and, and pull away at your support. And, I don't know, man. I feel like those are probably people who watch too much reality television. <laughs> they start to think that that's what real life looks like. It's like people who go on Twitter and they think that, that Twitter is real life. <laughs> I don't think I did it justice, but it's the first time. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?